Hi, I'm Susan Scott. Welcome to Agile First and Safe Second. Um, like many of you in the Agile community, um, you might be a little uh, um, quizzical as to um, why safe. And uh, to be honest, I was very much in that same camp for many years. But in the last year, um, I've discovered how Safe Second um, is really benefiting our organization. And that's what I want to talk about today. So first of all, just a little bit about me. Um, I started out in the waterfall world as a program manager, probably like some of you, um, mostly in the telecoms industry. I've built uh, mobile phone networks in uh, all sorts of countries, including Seoul, Malaysia, um, the US, um, Lisbon, you name it. Um, but somewhere along the road, then I started uh, moving into more PMO and portfolio management. And so kind of building on my program management, then into PMO and portfolio management. Um, again, I took kind of broader roles um, in Europe predominantly and then ended up landing in London in 2000. Um, I worked for Vodafone until the end of 2006. And at that point, I'd really gotten into um, product development. So doing portfolio management um, in a product development environment. Um, and um, what I was finding was applying waterfall methodologies to software development just didn't work. So I discovered Agile, started looking at that. And then in 2007, I left uh, Vodafone and work, went to work for a company called Dunhumby, where I was director of R&D. And there I introduced Agile um, and saw the huge benefits that it brought to software development and quite honestly, never looked back. But building on my background in program management, portfolio management, and so on, I really looked at agility, not just from the engineering, the technology side of things, but also how that really applied to the, the, the enterprise. And that's really where my kind of focus and, and expertise now, I think, really lies in trying to understand what needs to be different. Um, so in 2012, um, I went to work for PayPal, um, and I was running the EMEA uh, program office, plus driving lean portfolio management for our EMEA organization, and uh, really made some significant strides there, also around product management and how we did product management. Then went on to Barclays for four years and uh, was part of um, the Agile Transformation Group, and again, my focus being predominantly on working with Barclays Bank to help them um, start thinking in terms of outcomes um, and how to break the work down into smaller chunks that we could deliver more frequently um, to meet our customer needs. And then uh, I got an opportunity to come to Copenhagen uh, to work for Nets Group. So Nets is a payment services provider, um, predominantly in the Nordics and the DAC region. Um, and we're in the process of merging with an Italian company called Nexi, uh, which is really going to give us a, you know, cross Europe footprint of being the digital payments champion across Europe. So we're on a really exciting journey from a product perspective as well. And then a year ago, um, my boss at the time said uh, he wanted to introduce SAFE. Now, I've been doing a lot of safe-like things for years, but quite honestly, um, I had a slight allergic reaction to safe, like many people do. Um, more, us more sort of agile purists, I guess. Um, but I had some friends at the scale at Scaled Agile Inc. I had a call with them, and we went through Safe 5.0, 5, 5 and I thought, you know, this could actually work. And what I said to my boss then was, look, I'm really happy to implement safe, but agile first. And so our mantra throughout the organization has always been agile first, safe second. And that's enabled us to do a couple of things. One is it built on the agile foundation that we already had in place. And quite honestly, all the people that have been working on this for so long, it really gave them an ability to understand why it was important to start bringing in safe concepts. So 
that journey was a much smoother one because people understood why we were now going to do this and how it was going to be different. The other thing that it enabled me to do is quite honestly, SAFE is a framework that is out of the box. It comes with all the training. There's lots of SAFE experts out there. Be careful on the ones you choose. Um, but there are some really, really, really good people out there with who have a similar um, lens on agility as I do, which is again, agile first, safe second. So I know we've all heard those, the stories about, you know, oh, people implement safe and they never actually become agile because they're just following a textbook. Well, agile first, safe second means that you actually can avoid that and do it right. Um, and this has brought me into my role now, which I tell people it's, it's my dream job. I now um, uh, head up product operations for merchant services in Next. Um, and it gives me all of the tools that uh, I love to have in my toolbox because I own the Agile and Safe Transformation. I have lean portfolio management in my team. And I also have product insights. So I have a team that looks at the performance of our products, which links into our OKRs, but also links into our customer centricity and the work and the insights that we actually provide to our merchants. So I found my my home in this uh, in this company in, in Copenhagen and I feel really lucky to be here. So Agile first. So simply for me, it's about culture. So if you see the boys in the picture on the left, right, they're all running in a race and they're really, you know, trying to win. And, you know, it's all about them and them in the moment. You look at the boys on the right, right? You got the blue soccer team and the red soccer team. Um, and it's all about teamwork. So when you're playing soccer, you're learning how the two boys in blue, um, one's got the ball and the other one's um, guarding him to keep the guys in red away. And the guys in red are working together to figure out how they can get that ball away from the guys in blue. So for me, Agile First is really about the cultural change that we're trying to make here. It's about moving from it's all about me winning the race to it's all about us winning as a team. And that's what you get when you focus on Agile First. It's about the we, not the I. So what does that mean? So I think of things in terms of people, processes, and tools, right? So obviously the individual in, in, in Agile is, is uh, you know, the predominant thing. But ultimately, when you're scaling Agile, you need people, and they're number one, but you also need processes and tools to support that. So when we start with Agile first and people, what does it mean? Again, it's about being a team. Um, as we talked about the soccer ball, soccer team just now. The other really key thing is about learning to be empowered. When you're in a scrum team, you're expected to be empowered in the team and in the team context. But I've found actually working with scrum teams over years now that actually understanding what empowerment means um, is actually quite a cultural mental shift for people. Many teams, development teams, are so used to just taking orders that they almost, quite honestly, forget to be able to think for themselves. And so, again, part of this cultural shift then is about you and the team learning to be empowered to say, okay, tell me what is the outcome you're trying to achieve and let me think about the best way for us to get there. So learning to be empowered is a new skill for a lot of people. And then you've got new roles, learning to be a scrum master or a product owner. You might've been a business analyst or a dev lead or a QA uh, manager or QA or a tester. And now you're in a new role and you've got to adjust to that new role and the team needs to adjust to you in that new role. So there's a lot of cultural change about being agile when we start with Agile first. Then we need to look at what processes we need to change when we're going Agile. The first thing is we've now got a single prioritized team backlog. And again, we do that together, but that's, that's quite different. It's a different way of looking at the work. And the work is the thing that we are now going to significantly change 
because we want to break it into, as we say, smaller batch sizes. So features and stories. So learning how to break the work down into features and stories that can be delivered in the right way at the right time and then prioritizing those items in that backlog. That's a new way of working that we need to get our heads around. The other thing is, is that we plan the work more frequently. And obviously lots of people think that actually in Agile you don't plan at all. Um, no, we actually plan more frequently, more diligently than we do in uh, the old ways of working. So we need to learn how to plan more frequently. Um, and we also now, because we've got smaller batch sizes, we can now release the work more frequently, which means our customers are getting the value more frequently. And this, again, is one of the key process changes that makes, um, um, makes us become more agile. And then finally, in tools, you know, we need different tools to do our jobs, right? So um, we may choose to use Scrum or Kanban. To me, those are tools. What is the right tool for your team? Um, some people work better with a two-week iteration and the Scrum ceremonies around it. Some people work better with a Kanban board and being able to pull off that board and keep that, keep that continuous flow going. Um, we use Jira typically, right? So instead of getting a big Word document of 100 pages with a bunch of um, requirements in it, we're now using Jira with tickets for stories and features and so on. So we organize the work differently. We use a different tool to manage the work. We need to get DevOps going. Agile without DevOps mm, isn't really agile, right? So we've got to focus on how we bring DevOps into our ways of working. And then we need to measure different things, right? It's not about RAG reports anymore. It's about really understanding our predictability. Did we do what we said we were going to do? Are we releasing software with better quality? We should be because we're building quality into our, in our, into our ways of working. And what does our flow like, look like? What are the um, impediments that we have to our flow? What's slowing us down? What can we change? So Agile First, for me, really is about these people, processes, and tools which create actually a cultural change in terms of ways of working. So I think if you approach Agile first and you kind of get, as I think of it, kind of the engine running, then you're ready to actually start scaling. So this is when we go on to safe. So safe second for me then, it's really about the ecosystem. So you see the school of fish on the left. Um, this is my scrum team, right? They learn how to get their, their team working. They're swarming around the work. They're, um, they're a school. They, they know what they need to do. They're, they're all part of the same team in their uh, blue and yellow shirts. The picture on the right, though, is about a coral reef. A coral reef, reef is a, a great example of an ecosystem. For the coral to survive, it needs the fish. For the fish to survive, they need the coral, they need the plankton, et cetera, et cetera. You also need different fish, not just one kind of fish. So the coral reef is a perfect example of how when we're scaling Agile from one team to multiple teams, it's then about how these multiple teams really work together to ensure that the e ecosystem can actually deliver the value to the customer. So think about that coral reef and that ecosystem when you're thinking about scaling and scaling using SAFE. So again, back to our people, what does it mean? It means that we now need to understand not just about being in our team, but being in a team of teams in an agile release train. And actually setting up those trains has really brought those teams together even though they may have been working side by side before, um, now that they're in an arch, they have a release train engineer, they have a product manager that's managing the flow of work and prioritizing the work in their backlog, you see a very different um, cultural change again happening. Um, I've got one art that we've re launched recently and they, they still think that they're individual teams within this thing called an art. So we're not quite there with them yet. 
but they're getting there. They're starting to realize that now they're bigger, part of a bigger thing, part of that ecosystem, part of the coral reef. So being empowered now in that value stream context, in that coral reef, also means something a little bit different. Yes, we want to focus on what our priorities are, but also we need to understand the bigger picture and how we um, contribute to the bigger, uh, the bigger goal. And again, we've got new roles, release train engineers. Um, what does that mean? How do I become an RTE? Maybe you were a scrum master before, maybe you were a dev lead, uh, but we need people who've got you know, that good organizational skills, understand the technology, and who have a really great way of managing stakeholders and running things like PI planning events. And then our product manager on the art, this person is absolutely crucial. Um, this person is managing essentially a team of product owners and, and product managers, but they need to be the voice of the agile release train out to the business, out to the stakeholders, and really kind of protect the product owners that are sitting within the, the art from a lot of the noise. So getting our arts up and running and people understanding how they fit in and also between arts, how does that work? How do we now work together? Next, what we look at then again is the process, right? So again, we're looking at some changes here. And one of the key things, while we started our pivot from projects to products before, now our pivot from projects to products is really going 100%. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means, particularly in terms of our financial processes a little bit later. But this pivot is really allowing us now to really harness getting our products at the, so, at the, the core of everything rather than uh, thinking about projects. We manage a single, single portfolio backlog, right? So and that's part of my job at Nets, right? I manage the portfolio backlog of ethics into the organization. And I have a governance process that I run um, that I keep as light touch as possible. But again, I'm managing a single portfolio backlog and cascading that through the organization. So again, that's a different process change. My job also is about prioritizing epics based on value. So I've engaged with my business owners, my salespeople, they now know how to raise a capability and Jira Align is the tool that we use to manage our governance process. They know how to raise a capability in Jira Align, how to give me a value score by asking a number of questions. And then based on that, I can then prioritize all of those epics that I have my, in my backlog based on value. And then we then continue our governance process by always pulling off the item with the highest value off the top. So this has really been um, a huge transformation. And the sales guys, I can't tell you, they just love it. It's the first time that they've had transparency on where their ideas are. And they can really understand, well, why those other five things are going ahead of, instead of their thing. It gives them the context and the transparency has been absolutely um, transformational. Um, we plan these epics across art. So our arts are... Um, predominantly around products. So a lot of epics will cut across art. So we deliver solutions. We haven't implemented the safe solution approach. We feel that's too heavy, um, but we do do planning across the arts and through our um, portfolio sync and the way that we're working, we're finding that that is um, sufficient for our needs. And again, the next most important thing for me is continue to release more frequently. Um, one of the things that I've really seen in SAFE, um, particularly if you don't go agile first, is that you still tend to do big bang releases, which you know are just not effective. Um, so continue to release more frequently. The more frequently, the better. Um, decouple that architecture. So changing our processes and harnessing some of the tools that come out of um, the safe toolkit um, and applying them within context is absolutely critical. Back to our tools. So we now need some different things to do our job. So product governance, as I mentioned, I'll talk about in a minute, but that's been a significant tool in the way that we work. We now are starting to plan on a common cadence. So 
as we launched each of our agile release trains, we enabled them to essentially launch when it made sense to them. Um, so we, we didn't really try to force them to get into a cadence when they, they launched their first uh, PI. Um, but, but what we are doing is by the end of this year, when we start in January of 2022, our art PI planning events will be aligned within a 10 day window. And that's close enough for me. Um, we need to be able to plan close together, but we don't really need to do our PI planning for all arts on the same couple of days. Some of them have dependencies, some of them don't. So what we've decided is within a 10 day window is close enough for us, it's close enough that we can manage those dependencies and make sure that we think get things planned in, um, in the right sequences. So that's the approach that we're taking. And we've got a number of arts that are already within that 10 day window. And then we've got a couple of outliers. So as I said, by the time we get to the end of the year, we'll be back on track. Um, JIRA Align has been fundamental in our uh, um, adoption of SAFE and also to scaling. Um, so JIRA Align integrated into JIRA gives us that connection from strategy to execution. Um, the JIRA users at the team level still continue to use JIRA, but actually they can now see more information higher up the portfolio hierarchy of what makes sense, why are we doing this, uh, what is the context that I need to understand, how then can I use that context to design and build this, this thing better. So JIRA Line has been uh, absolutely magical for us, quite honestly, um, and it's uh, um, finally answered my dream of having you know, my highest level strategic pillar all the way down visibility to the lowest um, you know, task in, in Jira. So um, I'm uh, a big fan. Um, measuring OKRs, that's the next step in our toolkit. Um, I'm not gonna talk much about OKRs today because we are literally just in the process of implementing them now. Um, but that is the next really key thing that is going to give us the guardrails, particularly for me, in terms of my product governance and what are the things that we're choosing to do and not choosing to do. So OKRs in the process of getting implemented now, uh, but more news on those later. So SAFE, achieving business agility. And this was the big reason that we decided that, it, that adopting SAFE was actually going to enable us to go faster. And quite honestly, it has. We started rolling out SAFE um, a year ago in August. In a year, we have come a really, really long way. We have launched seven Agile release trains in under a year. Um, we have made significant progress in our organization structure, on our governance, our financial processes, um, our product muscle through what we call our product academy. And now the next step for us, as I mentioned, is managing by OKRs. And I'll talk to that um, another time maybe. What we've really stopped doing in this real pivot for us is obviously we stopped resourcing projects and we've been doing Agile since about, I don't know, 2014 or so in, in Nets. Um, so we did really kind, kind of stop resourcing projects quite a long time ago, but not really. So we completely stopped doing that now. Um, we closed out all of our project business cases. Um, and this was a significant step forward in enabling us to pivot to products. And so what we now have are product-based business cases and then we, we use um, other methods of actually um, uh, cap capturing the value um, that we actually deliver through those products. So I'll talk about that more in a minute. We're stopping our waterfall project management. So we're still a little bit waterfall in our, in our project management space. Um, but when you don't have, you know, people that are resourced onto your project and you have to take the work to the people in the agile release trains, you kind of don't have much choice. But part of what we're doing at the moment is really starting to upskill our project and program managers 
to work more effectively in that kind of environment and enable the delivery of our solutions that we are building for our customers that cut across trains. One of the other key things is stopping budget decisions based on cost only. Now, last September, when we did our annual financial planning, it was just about cost, 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 cost. No focus on value at all. Um, it didn't really matter whether we needed another million euros to do something that would deliver 10 million euros or more in value, it didn't matter. Just this is the cost, that's it, doesn't matter. Um, and that's obviously incredibly frustrating when you're trying to deliver value the, for the company. Um, and um, we are now in the process of stopping that. So we are kicking off our financial planning for 2022 in August. And the first step is str strategy planning with all of our stakeholders um, and in particularly our salespeople. So this is going to be truly a different way of working with, um, from that this year. So we're really excited about that. So let's talk a little bit about then um, our target operating model, our org structure. So we made a decision in a, um, just over a year ago now in May 2019, we restructured our organization to be more closely aligned to our product groups and our value streams. So a product for us, for example, is onboarding for a merchant. So, um, and you need onboarding plus um, acquiring and merchant settlement and various other things in the payments transaction uh, value stream to actually build a solution. But what we decided was let's build our uh, product structure more closely aligned to uh, groups of products that, that, uh, that are, are relevant to each other. And so um, we did that last May. And um, what has gone well with that is that it's brought people closer together by having common goals. So we have definitely noticed that as we uh, defined our objectives for 2021, we cascaded those across the organization. It was much simpler to actually align people around those common goals in the organization structure that we put in place. So that was great. What didn't go so well was that um, skill gaps became more apparent. And in principle, I think the skill gaps were all, always there. It's just that we didn't really see them. So, okay, you could say that that was actually a positive, right? Because because we could see them, there was more transparency. We then had a, had the opportunity to actually start start fixing those. But there were some really bumpy months where um, we didn't really understand. Well, how does this work now? And things were falling, you know, through cracks. Um, but ultimately, by about November of last year, we made a few tweaks. And uh, we're, in a, we're in a really good situation now. The thing that this new org structure also gave us was the ability when we started to introduce SAFE and launch the arts was to launch arts predominantly in the org structure where they were in these product groups. So um, I always like to start where you are. And so actually being able to start where we were in that product group and establish the art there, get them up and running, and then we can then start looking at how we then optimize those arts to be more effective and minimize further dependencies. So starting where we are within that structure was really a positive thing um, for, for everyone. Secondly, governance. So I think we're all familiar with the uh, rocks, pebbles, sand uh, analogy when people go to grit and other things. But um, part of the thing that was really important for me with product governance is that we understand what we're governing. And the, from the outset, I've said, look, I'm not interested in governing sand. You guys in the product teams, in the agile release, release trains, in the scrum teams, you know what's important in terms of the small stuff that you need to do to keep the lights on, do maintenance, be compliant, etc. 
I trust you to own that. So that was the first step. The next step we said, well, actually for big decisions for the rocks, and we just find 1 million euros as our investment um, uh, in, in the first two years, um, was the, the division between what we actually need to take to our more senior leader, leadership, so our merchant services uh, leadership team. So if we have an investment that's greater than a million, we take that to our merchant services strategic governance board, and then they decide whether, whether we should do that or not. Um, and this will flow really well into our strategy uh, planning that we're gonna be kicking off in August uh, because it will um, align with us to stop defining our strategic objectives for 2022, which are certainly gonna be in excess of a million. So that's going to, that's going to flow really well. So that kind of leaves me with the, the, the pebbles in the middle. And our pebbles are our various sizes, um, but typically they're somewhere between 150K to a million, a million euros. Um, so this is where the product governance comes in. And we think of this as our discretionary spend. So the only part that I'm really governing is our discretionary spend. So if we've got 100 million uh, euros for our budget, you know, there's probably half of that is going to um, our big strategic initiatives. We've got maybe another 25% that's going to mandatory compliance, maintenance, really small change. So then maybe I've got 25 million that I'm governing in any given uh, financial year that we want to decide, well, how is it best to, to get the best return on that? And so um, that product governance has been up and running since January. We have... Um, uh, a monthly meeting with our sales team. So we have uh, large and key accounts, so our locker sales team, and then our SME, small, medium enterprise sales team. So we have two different boards that we're running with them at the moment. Um, and we focus on, you know, what are their strategic objectives? What are their revenue objectives? How do we then um, align the capabilities that are being requested from their sales team against those objectives, do our impact assessments, work out what we can actually deliver and give them then the ability to prioritize their backlog flowing into our development teams, into our trains. So product board governance going really, really well. Um, and again, the transparency, I think, is the critical thing that has given us, uh, quite honestly, coming from a bit of a, a bad rap of, oh, you guys never deliver anything, to uh, now really clear, transparent, what are we doing and what are we not doing? Agility in financial processes. Um, <laughs> this is one of the hardest things to do. Um, and we've had a number of conversations with our group finance team and also with our auditors. Um, we had a, um, an audit earlier this year. And one of the things that came out in that audit was, well, what do you mean you're not going to do this project? You, you, you did a business case for this project with a you know, a three-year business case or a five-year business case or whatever it might be, and you're a year and a half into it, and now you're saying you're not doing that project anymore? Well, yeah, because we're pivoting to be agile to go where the opportunities are. So we now actually recognize that going after that opportunity is not as, going, as good as going off of this other opportunity. Well, now what do we do? How do we handle that business case? Uh, you know, we thought we were capitalizing all this stuff. Well, now we can't capitalize it. So we got into some quite knotty conversations around that. But actually, that really helped us having those conversations because then we went back and we said, look, what we really want to do is have business cases based on our products. So what's a product, right? So a product is something that is long lived, at least five years. It follows a product life cycle. So we have an idea, we need a new product. So we have an initial build phase. We then have um, enhancements. And then at some point we're gonna say, actually, you know, we're now gonna deprecate this product um, and build something else or go into something else. So if we build, for example, a five-year business case for our product, we actually have something that is a lot more stable that we can then track with our financial uh, uh, counterparts. 
The other argument was, well, look, we do our budgeting on an annual basis and our budgets are aligned around our products because our products is how we actually build and deliver things. So if we budget around our products and our products are part of a business case, then we can also measure them quarterly. How are we doing? We track them monthly anyway, based on cost, capitalization, et cetera. So actually now we're bringing our processes closer together. And then the other key thing obviously is our products are staffed continuously through our trains. So we're not wasting time waiting for resources to be available to come to a project. The resources are there. We bring them the work, they start the work when the work is ready to be started. So our argument back to them was actually quite successful because then they were able to see how this gave them a more stable way to manage their financial processes. We then had a conversation about what's a project, right? So um, the way we look at a project is it's an opportunity that we choose to invest in. And any opportunity could be really small or it could really be really big, right? And so what we do for these opportunities is what we call a strategic business case, which is built on our uh, essentially a lean uh, business model canvas idea. So our opportunities, our projects um, have a strategic business case, which identifies what is the opportunity, the size of this opportunity, what is the benefit where the value we're going to create. And then what we decide is, well, what investment, what is our investment appetite to actually achieve this thing? So we do a really lightweight business case um, on the opportunities. And then we append those to our product business case. And then we review those on a quarterly basis and we work out, you know, is our business case still correct, particularly for the financial year that we're in and the next financial year that's coming up? Because what we want to be able to see is were our predictions in terms of benefits correct? Are we choosing the right investments to achieve those benefits? So that's how our projects, our opportunities then now relate to our products. And this is actually giving us a much more stable way of working. And also, quite honestly, from the you know hundreds of business cases that were project-based that we had before, we have about 20 product-based business cases, which, again, is a lot easier to manage. So this process that we've now agreed with, uh, with group finance and, and auditors um, is really starting to bed in. Um, and um, they're starting to get it and see how this is actually going to benefit us. The other thing that we did in our uh, agile financial process is around CapEx. So as you know, um, in a Scrum uh, Agile environment, capitalization can be a little tricky. What can you capitalize? What can't you capitalize? And so again, we've had some long discussions with our finance colleagues and uh, got them to understand that any role that is related to um, an agile release train, so your RTE, your, your product manager, your product owners, and the roles related to your, um, your front teams, your product owners, your squad masters, obviously all of your devs, tests, et cetera, all of that is almost 100% capitalizable. Now, we weren't capitalizing product management, um, um, uh, our product owners or our scrum masters before. So we were only capitalizing less than 50% of our total spend on a product. So now with this new agreement of being able to capitalize these other roles because they are contributing to the value, we've increased our total CapEx from less than 50% to around about 80% on all of our products. That varies depending on um, you know, how much technical debt we might need to do and resolve. And sometimes technical debt can be capitalized, sometimes it can't. Same thing with compliance for us, obviously in financial services, there's a lot of compliance work that we need to do uh, for Visa, MasterCard, the schemes, as well as our regulatory um, uh, um, uh, um, 
people. So when we look at compliance, again, if compliance is enabling us to keep our license to operate, we now have agreement with finance that we can actually capitalize that. Again, pushing our um, capitalization ratio right up there. And that obviously has a massive positive impact on our EBITDA. So some really significant um, achievements just in the last about four months um, with our finance colleagues in getting these things to work. Um, finally, I'm just gonna wrap up on our Product Academy. So we launched the Product Academy last uh, September. Um, and what we did was we decided that we really needed to invest in our product management muscle. Um, and, and it's not just product management in terms of the role, it's about all roles related to product development. So it, yes, it is a lot about what does it mean to do, be a great product manager? What does it mean um, to be um, uh, managing products in the payments industry? Um, but it's also about agile and safe and how that relates to our product centricity. We also realized with lots of new people coming into the company that we also needed to educate people on our products. So our product academy is a one-stop shop. You want to know what products that we offer in uh, merchant services or in uh, IES, which is our other business unit. You want to know more about how to be a great product manager or what does great product management look like. You want to understand what does agile and product ownership have to do with me and my job. Um, and also um, mind the product. We've got licensing for that. And we're offering uh, to uh, a selected uh, group of our team access to mind the product and all the great learnings that come through uh, that come through that uh, uh, those guys. So the Product Academy has really been about helping everyone to self-learn um, about what's great about building great products. Um, and we use a lot of external content, but we also um, create our own content. So you can see there we've got a talk on design thinking with some of our people um, at NETS and, um, and our um, head of product for um, IES, Brian Harris, um, Omar uh, Hack for uh, Ecom and uh, uh, Kim Orlaroga for our um, p and &E team. You know, we, we do lots of content that we, can, we create ourselves so that we can share the great stuff that we're doing in that. So Product Academy has been a, a huge success. We've got um, well over 600 users. Um, and as you can see, we've got kind of a leaderboard there so that we can see, you know, who our top learners are. So uh, you can see, I, I probably need to do a bit more learning because I'm, I'm, I'm way down there on the number 647 there. So I've got to get busy. Um, so that's essentially why Safe for Me is a really great building block to get you to agility um, at the enterprise and business level. And why Agile First, I think, is the great foundation to get us started. So Agile First change the culture, get the teams working, get those engines going, safe second, focus on that ecosystem and bring those great teams along, those schools of fish into your coral reef and get everything up and running. Thanks very much.